Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the study this morning. We're going to continue our study on the book of Judges. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have to study each morning. And for this time this morning, as we begin a new week of studies, uh, reviewing uh, the lines in, in the book of Judges. And we are thankful, Lord, for your providence providence in your leading and the way that you help us in our day-to-day -day lives. We ask for your spirit to speak to us and to the hearts of those around us that we have contact with. We pray, Lord, that we can represent you correctly and um, give us wisdom and understanding in dealing with others. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you can bring a conviction and a power uh, to our lives. We can see our need of you that we can cling to you, and that we can be corrected when we are in error. Uh, we pray for your leading now in this study. Help us to understand the things that we are studying. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So what you see in front of you is, is not what we have, well, it's judges, but we're not there to review this line yet. But I thought I should bring this up because what of what happened yesterday. Uh, so yesterday, um, it was noted by uh, Brother Bry that uh, uh, it's 126 days since November 9th. And, and this is, is an important point in that uh, what happened yesterday, I think, fits into this line of Samson and Delilah. Now, if you look at this line, Originally, we had put in here temporarily, uh, April 8th, 2023. So that was when the Dwight presented to the Canadian group, uh, basically an invitation uh, for the camp meeting. Um, yesterday was two weeks after that, so 14 days later, um, uh, that uh, Brother Bright notices this 1260 days from November 9th. I mean, I've noticed it in the past, never really thought much about it, but, uh, and other people have been noting it and saying some important event is going to happen um, on that date. But um, <clears throat> during the a dis conversation last night, so this was in the morning meeting that uh, Brother Brian also read uh, some counsel in the spirit of prophecy regarding um, gossip and uh, criticizing our brethren and the need for unity. And so when I went to the study, Colin study last evening, uh, Brother Jonah was, was discussing um, things about the need that we are part of a family and that, um, that we need to be able to reconcile the differences that happen. I didn't catch everything he said. And then it ended up being a discussion because uh, Colin talked for a bit and I talked for a bit and and then Bonnie talked at some point. I can't remember exactly when it was in the study last night, but she talked about this meeting that she had come to on April 8th, 2022. So we had this meeting. Ron, you got to keep your mic off. Sorry, I didn't notice it was on. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I can't remember exactly in the meeting when it was, but um, uh, she, she brought up this meeting from April 8th, 2022. So it was like, um, I don't know, it was, it was quite a long meeting, however many minutes. It was about four hours or something like that, a Friday night study. It was number 14 of, of the Presidents of the United States study. And now originally we had put April 8th, 2023 there, but she she referred back to this study of April 8th, 2022. And that was a year and 14 days previous to yesterday. So I thought that was interesting that we have that symbol of 114, which can either be uh, information, you know, 411. It can also be the Passover. 
as a symbol. Um, now, so this April 8th and April 22nd uh, would be this formalization. Now from April 22nd, from yesterday, to the camp meeting is 107 days. So that's another symbol that, that we can see there. Um, so we're going to come back to this later on, but I just wanted to note this um, and show that I changed this chart, whether that's correct or not. So, um, so this just takes the line of Samson here and then the line of Samson and Delilah. So we will we'll come back to that at some future date, right, when we, when we get there. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so what we, we have been studying is we, we completed, as, as far as I can see, uh, um, I don't think we have to go back to uh, uh, Shamgar, but we're now looking at Deborah and Barak. And I just got it. So... So we had started Deborah and Barak last study, and there were some points. Um, uh, actually, we had a comment in the <clears throat> on the video itself. That comment was a uh, Bonnie made a comment uh, because we had a discussion regarding. Um, Uh, marriage in the Sabbath, and we had a discussion regarding um, 2015. So in 2015, uh, I guess in July of 2015, gay marriage was legalized in the USA. And um, she says that's the external. And uh, the General Conference in the same month took a stand that women should not be elders or pastors. That was an internal so in 2015, one of the two institutions was destroyed externally, but sustained internally. The only institution that remains to be addressed is Sabbath at the Sunday law. We are in the end times and events are unfolding rapidly. So, so that's what she wrote there in the video. Now, the question that I had is why did Jeff, um, so I guess it was June 26, 2015, according to Angela, so that they made the Supreme Court decision. Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, why did Jeff take events after October 22, 1844, and align them with our movement? What was he doing in doing that? So, I mean, I know this is... This is answering a question um, from, from Thursday. So we may not remember all the context. I know I don't remember all the context of why it was brought up. So maybe somebody remembers. Uh, was it to do with the repeat of Millerite history? Well, yeah, it had to do with the repeat of Millerite history, but there was a particular reason why we brought it up. I just can't remember why we brought up marriage and the Sabbath. It has something to do with the repeat of Millerite history. I just don't remember in the study why we um, why we brought it up. Um, but anyway, the question the question still remains. Does anybody know particularly why we would take history after October 22? and align it with our history. If, because, you know, the basic understanding of the lines that we have is we're repeating, we're in the time of the second angel's messages. <coughs> but we also apply periods after October 22 as parallels to our history. Um, and the question is, what is the basis for doing that? What was the reason that Jeff gave for doing that? My guess would be that we, he was looking for the empowerment and or the uh, formalization. 
of? Uh, after 1844. Formalization of, of what? The message. Midnight cry? Sorry. No, it definitely wouldn't be the midnight cry. I mean, uh, the no, formation of the angel. message. What, what event happened in 1844? That was the coming down of the second angel, right? Third angel. Oh, that was third. I'm sorry. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. So at well, October 22. Formation of the, I'm sorry. Was it the formation of the first angel's message? Of which, after October 22, 1844? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So what's the basis that Jeff has for taking... Because we do the same. I mean, we still do this, but it, it came up. Um, right. So we were talking. No, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about uh, baptism. Right. So we were talking about Parminder's movement and organization and the reason behind why they believed organization was necessary. And. Um, and why they were rebaptizing. So that's that's why it came up. And so uh, this had to do with Ellen White's baptism, that is, uh, that she was rebaptized after October 22, 1844. Right. Um, so just like marriage in the Sabbath, we also have baptism. Right. So now I don't know much about that history about her rebaptism. Um, does anybody know about that? Uh, Ellen White being rebaptized. I, had, I, I never looked. What, Dwight? I didn't catch what you said. I said I had never looked into that. Okay. Because I mean, that's what I remember is that Ellen White was rebaptized, but I don't know anything about that. So. But this, this was a reason given that I remember for the fact that the movement needed to be rebaptized. It had to do with we, we were creating a new organization. We needed to be rebaptized. And that was based upon uh, the idea that Ellen White was rebaptized. So, um, so. I mean, she was, because I can find it here. I'm just trying to find the date of it. Um, uh, so she was baptized when she was 14 into the Methodist Church. So after they started keeping the Sabbath, they were rebaptized. There's no record of the time or place where James baptized her or who was present to witness the rite. But James, in the only record of the experience, wrote that immediately as he raised her out of the water, she was taken off in vision. So <clears throat> uh, Life Incidents, page 273. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, on receiving baptism at my hands in an early period of her experience, I was raised as I raised her up out of the water, immediately she was envisioned. Envision. So that's Life Incidents, page 273. So an interesting number there. Um, so, so we brought that up um, because we were dealing with uh, Parminder's message, so Sisera. And, and there was this, this call for, re, for organization 
and um, something that I was opposed to because um, I didn't see that it properly fell in our lines. But they took this history after October 22, Sabbath marriage and Ellen White's rebaptism as as a fact that our movement was coming out of, of the Adventist church, that we are to organize into a new church, that we would call people out of the Adventist church into our church. Our church was going to get a new name. Um, and of course, the Omega group uh, continues with a new name, whatever it is. Um, not quite sure. The White Stone, I know, is the Canadian group's name. I'm not sure if that... Um, but anyway, it probably doesn't matter. <clears throat> but what, what is the reasoning then that we can take that history after October 22 and parallel it with our history? Because we do that. So why do we do that? Now, one of the reasons we do it is, you know, after our disappointment, July 18, 2020, uh, we parallel that with October 22, 1844. But do we have a reason prior to November 9th, 2019, to say that we experienced a disappointment in which we can place the organization of this movement? And, and if we do, where would we place that? I have 2014 on mine. Right. So 2014. So if we're doing that, we know that we're in a different line, right? A different line than, that, than uh, November 9th and July 18th being disappointments, right? So, yep. so what line is that where we're going to have 2014 as a parallel to the disappointment, the great disappointment. So when we looked at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, uh, do we have uh, 2014 as a disappointment? Yes. Yeah, we do. Now, I'll just flip over here and you, you'll see what I mean. Now, so we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So that's a complete line. We have the line of Shamgar. And we all have also have the line of Ehud. Right? Now, um, we don't have the line of Othniel written out as a separate line. Um, but here we know that this is 9-11. Uh, that is, in the line of the judges... Um, the judge's line here, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, are zoom into 9-11. Now, in this line, the judge's line, 9-11 is the arrival of, of the first angel. But we know that this is zooming into uh, the line above, above it, where the second angel's message arrives. And that line then is 
uh, the judge's line is a zoom into 9-11, right? So we've been zooming into 9-11. And um, <clears throat> so, so when we look at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, uh, we can see that um, in this first line, this disappointment is going to be the third angel arriving. That's October 22, 2014. So we're taking 2014 as um, Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar's line, right? So that would be a disappointment. So we can see that if we're looking at the line that follows that, um, which is going to be the line of Deborah and Barak, we can see that the line of Deborah and Barak addresses um, this events after 2014. So part of this period of darkness that we haven't addressed, we say it's organizational darkness, right? But we can see that in that organizational darkness, this is a, there is a reform line there, but that reform line is the reform line of a progressive destruction of four. That is, we should be able to take that history and, and place after 2014 a line that addresses that darkness so that when we get to Deborah and Brack, that's going to address this reform line that arrives on September 23rd, 2017. That 2014 is part of that history. That is, we need to create a line. I think that we actually need to do this, but we need to create a line of that history of what happened in 2014 uh, with the rise of Parminder, um, with the organization uh, that was going on that precedes September 23rd, 2017. Does that, does that make sense to people? Somewhat. It follows the pattern. W what's that? I didn't I hear said, it. I said it follows the pattern. Yeah, so it follows the pattern, right? So now Jeff was correctly, in my view, understanding the parallel between Millerite history after October 22 and our history, but he wasn't aware of the line that he was on. Now, now when we think about the organization of the Adventist church, um, that follows the disappointment, right? So you're going to have a line going from October 22, 1844 uh, to 1863, right? And, and do we look at that history of 1863 favorably? No, we don't really look at it favorably. Right. So, so we know that the, re the reason that the church organized was because it was Laodicean. That is, it had failed in its mission. And so to me, organization of this movement would be an acknowledgement of the failure of this movement. That all you could get... Agreeable. Is, yeah, all you would get is um, a delay, right? You would have to have all this reform line happen again, right? Now, what they argued is that Ellen White's line was a line of failure, that that the Adventist line. And ours is a line of success. And they set up a false structure trying to argue this. Now, back in 2015, I had shown Parminder that there was always a failed reform line after, after a reform line. That there's a falling away, that this is something that we had taught, but it is actually a reform line. And um, this would have gone contrary to what Parminder was teaching, because it, it's 
if you when you repeat history, you repeat history. Right. What we have is we have in every reform line a third angel arriving because we have a reform that is demonstrates and develops two classes of worshipers. But then it, it comes as an increase of light. So some truth is recovered. But then there's a falling away that then re results in a progressive destruction of four and then another reform line. And that in our time, all these reform lines come together. And for the first time, the third angel is empowered um, at the Sunday law. That is, all of history has been culminating on this Sunday law, the events of the end of the world. And when I say the Sunday law, in the very broadest sense, um, all of those events dealing with the close of probation and the, the seven last plagues, and the second coming of Christ, of which the destruction of Jerusalem was a type, both in 586 and 70 AD, right? So, so when we look at that history of marriage and the Sabbath, and rebaptism, they are part of a history that is past that led to the Omega, right? Yes. And they would be typical, right? Yes. Of something that's going to happen in the future, but, but in a positive sense, right? Because even negative reform lines typify the reform line at the end of the world. So we can't take that history of the marriage um, in that in that history and and do anything else with it other than is typical, right? Uh, because it's in a negative sense, and it's not because what we think. Here's, here's what conservative Adventists generally think, and people who have been a part of this movement in the past, is that those events are the events of prophecy leading to the Sunday law. In, the, in, the, in a sense, they are. But they're not the events of the Sunday law. But we can see how all of that history, um, the organization of this movement, what was happening in the church, what was happening in the United States. And, and I don't know if even internal and external define it enough because those issues, did they become issues with the Omega? Did, did the Omega take a stand on marriage and homosexuality? Do they take a stand upon the Sabbath um, and upon baptism yeah i think they did right so all of those things were fulfilled typically in our history within this movement but also we could say externally but but really on different levels because both the united states and the church are addressing those issues but we know that the church even though they voted to not have women ordained of course that didn't really stop anything from happening and the church is progressively moving uh, towards wokeism. Because no matter what the organization tries to do, uh, it, can't, uh, it can't change the tide of the world because it's part of the world. And so it's getting swept away. So they can hold back the tide for a time. But at some point, the church will not just accept wokeism, but also accept Sunday sacredness. Now, now it could be that the church would end up reacting against wokeism in some way, that there may be a, a civil war, so to speak, within the church, just like there is in the United States. And in some degrees, there is in the church. But we need to see that all of that history is typical. So when we look at Deborah and Barak, and we, when we look at this line here, um, this is a message in response to Parminder's message. 
And this message is from September 23rd, 2017 to November 9th, 2019. And, and we have to decide, is this message correct that, that we're depicting here? Is this the correct message? And if it is, uh, it's a message that we need to heed. Right, because I would say that within this movement, this movement generally is un or this message is unheeded. That is, in the discussion yesterday, uh, there is a belief that, and and I could be expressing what Colin said incorrectly, but I'm just going to try to do it. Is that he disagrees with the idea that Ju the lesson of July 18th was that we could not predict events. So he rejected that idea that that's what we learned from July 18th, that we we could set dates, we could put dates in the future, but we could not know what those events are. He says that that's incorrect, right? But I would think that what is being taught by this line here is that we cannot predict events. Even though this is a line, a message about time, if we really examine what this message is about, it is a message that is tied to the idea that our movement in using time is paralleling Samuel Snow's letters. Right? That's the idea that we have here. So, I mean, this is really about November 9th. It's about Parminder's date, but it's about a witness of why Parminder's date is not, will, will not, why it's a failed prediction. So, so Parminder's movement in predicting November 9th is, is typifying an incorrect idea of time setting. But within that, we had a witness that, that time is correct but not in the way that Parminder and Tess and, and even, you know, today people in the movement may be trying to use time. That is, we can't predict events. And, and it's connected to marriage, the Sabbath, organization, right? All of these false ideas that were um, part of that history in that period of darkness. A any thoughts on what I've said? Is there some correction that needs to be made? Um, I, I would be, be that sort of uh, slow to shut the door on that aspect of um, maybe, maybe not protecting the day or something, but maybe the year. Out of, out of some mm. events to me because I've, I've seen sort of a, I'm just some things that came to light that sort of thing that uh, maybe like Nashville happening in 2024 but I'm not being definite I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of it's a bit staggering but it's just, it's just some patterns and seeing that there could be a possibility Okay, so so I mean, I know that we can take dates and we can put them in the future and they're going to have symbols attached to them. But I would be leery about trying to say, well, because we have symbols attached to dates and they appear to point to an event, that we then would predict that event. Because because what we've seen so far in everything that we've done with our lines is we've never predicted any event, but we have had the dates that we have set on a line as part of a structure. And, and what I see is, you know, everything that I've seen so far and what we see in the judges is that we have this extension of time that God is illustrating that even though we have these events in our line, the events that we are actually uh, looking for, their fulfillment, is in the future in an unspecified way, but, but it's being marked by a specific date. 
April 5th, 2030. And so if we're going to have something happen in our line, it may be connected. We could put some of these dates there and we would, after the fact, see, oh, there's some significance of events that either happened internally within the movement or externally within the world. But they can't be the events that are being symbolized themselves because they have to be symbols. That is our line, in my understanding of it, is typical. It's still a type. It's not the actual events. Because that's what I think we've learned from what we've what we've done so far. Now, um, you know, so I, I posed the question to Colin yesterday because he was saying that June 3rd is when he's looking for Nashville event to occur. Um, but that if it doesn't occur, it doesn't really mean anything, right? So, so he's not saying that that's a prediction. He's saying, I think it's going to happen on that day. But if it doesn't happen on that day, it doesn't really matter. Um, which I have trouble with. I mean, I have trouble, and, and, and I compared what he was doing with Daniel Vanderhorst, and I have no problem with Daniel. It's just I know that when he was setting out his lines, he was looking for possibility that things might occur. Now, I don't know what happened in his life personally, but I haven't heard from him since his last video was posted. But, and, and I could be wrong, but it, it could be that he's just discouraged about, you know, saying anything. Right. And, you know, whether he, you know, and I don't know, I don't, I don't like guessing about what somebody's doing. There could be all kinds of other factors involved that I don't know about. But the question was, you know, what if your events don't happen? Right. And of course, if, if just like Daniel Vanderhorst, people can say, well, I'm assured, you know, even if it doesn't happen, I'm still going to be solid in the truth. Um, but I don't know if that people can give that kind of assurance about themselves you know you can say well we got through july 18th and i'm still in the message but that doesn't really mean anything because the question is you got through july 18th but have you learned anything because because human pride could uh cause us to continue to cling to something um at least for a time but that's a lot different than having true faith and trust in God. So people may uh, make an error and still maintain that error because, well, they don't want to admit that they were wrong about something. But that's not sufficient. And, and so my concern, so Colin said that he had to give this warning because this is what God has shown him, this chronology. And I said, well, I agree with the chronology and I agree that God gave it to you. But the purpose of it I believe to be different that it's it's for this movement. So Colin has to say what he believes is going to happen. And I have to give the warning that when it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that God has not been leading us. Right. Because, because just like Colin is compelled to say, I need to present what God's shown me. I believe that we need to present what God has shown us about these lines. Amen. Now, if events do happen in some way that are connected with the dates that we have, that doesn't mean that we can predict events. Because one is, I mean, we could keep setting dates and eventually one day something will happen on one of those dates. Odds are. Yeah, <laughs> You know, and we can just say, well, we predicted this, right? Now, one of the things that's interesting, of course, we know with, and it came up yesterday, was the 187 days from the end of the 100 days of prayer to the beginning of the 10 days of prayer, which began on January 6, 2021. So we had this 187 days, um, oh, pardon me, that 187 days, uh, yeah, yeah. That 187 days goes from uh, the end of July 4th, when the 100 days of prayer ended, uh, to the beginning of the 10 days of prayer on January 6th. And that 10 days of prayer ends January 16th, 2021. And 
that date, January 16th, divides uh, the 777 days into 434 days and 343. So that, that division of those days. Now, <clears throat> we also had 187 days from the publication of uh, on the on the 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 Sunday, June twenty first, to the bombing of Nashville on December twenty fifth, uh, twenty twenty. Now we didn't predict that, right? I mean, this is sort of that date, December twenty fifth. Of course, is the end of our line one year later. Um, but it was a witness both these dates, December 25th and January 6th, 13 days apart, was a witness of the correctness of July 18, 2020. Just like when the School of the Prophets is sold 187 days after July 18, 2020. So we have all of these events. We can witness to them. But one thing we cannot say is that we, we predicted the correct events or the correct date for those events, or that we even predicted these events, right? We didn't predict the bombing of Nashville on December 25th, and we didn't predict the siege of, of uh, Washington, D.C. on January 6th. But we can say that the lines, the time witnesses to our prediction. So, so if we're going to do, if we're going to say that, well, we were wrong about the time of the event, right? But, but see, I've ar argued that we are correct as to the time, but wrong about the event, just as the Millerites were on October 22, 1844. That is, that the symbols of those events were attached there, just like the symbols of the second coming of Christ were attached to October 22, 1844, right? You can't say they got the symbols wrong. No, you can't say that. Right. But what you can say is that they didn't recognize that the Day of Atonement would just begin on October 22, 1844, and that it was a period of time that would end, right? Ends with the second coming. Because they just believed that the Day of Atonement was a literal Earth Day. Which they should have known it was a period of time. How long a period? I mean, that... That would, it's hard to know how long that would have been, but they should have known that once that day of atonement began, uh, that it wasn't going to just end in a single day. Jesus wasn't going to come back that day. They could have known that. <clears throat> um, so, so then what they had is they had this history in where they're going to continue to time set. Right. So in early writings, page 74 and in other places at that time in 1850, Ellen White is talking about time setting that is going to come. And she's she's saying that we can't set the date. But we know we have Joseph Bates, who's looking to November of 1851, among others. Um, Sister Minor right, is one of those promoting that it's just going to be seven years. So. So even though they, they came to understand that the Day of Atonement began on October 22, and that was going to be a period of time, did they have justify, justification to predict when it would end? I mean, obviously they didn't. Do we have justification? Could we declare when the end of the Day of Atonement is going to be? According no. to this? No, we can't, right? So now, whether some events that we end up predicting happen or not, and, and I don't believe that God's going to allow it um, to happen as people predict. Um because I believe, at least within this movement, at least I'm hoping that people will start to see uh, what the purpose of this time is. It's not to predict events in the future. It's to witness to us of God's leading and to bring 
the power and conviction to our lives and to prepare us to give a message and to help us develop a message that we can give. Right? So all of these times, all of these dates are not our message to the Levites, right? To Seventh-day Adventists. This is not our message. I don't think it is. No. Um, well, to use the words of, of Ellen from the Canadian group or whichever group she's from, um, you know, it's too convoluted. Now, it's not really convoluted, but it's way too involved. It's way too detailed. But this is a message to us in this movement. This should give us confidence and faith that God has been leading us. And um, you know, there is um, you know, when we look at this line right in front of us, so we're, I mean we're gonna go through this line, but we see um, we can see in this line the line of the Levites, at least part of it, right? We can see the 126 days divided into two periods of 63 days. And we know that whole history, that 126 days, is Samuel Snow's letters from February 6th, 16th, to July 18th. Or not to July 18th, to June 22nd, actually. There's 126 days. And then there's 25 days to, uh, to July 18th. And that 25 days is... Um, you know, representative of the period of time of the 391 and a half. It's actually going to be uh, um, trying to figure out how that works. Is it 26 days? Anyway, it ends up being 391 to July 18, uh, 1845. And, and so that was another way in which we confirmed July 18th, Samuel Snow's letters. Actually, it's, um, you know, quite interesting interesting how that whole story happened which we don't have time for right now but the point is we have that history of the 126 days and then we have the 329 days which march 27th is the center to september 7th 2019 and then we have the first part of that 126 days that goes to um uh january 11th 2020 which I'm just going to tentatively put that in here. All right, so I'm going to take this, put it here. Change this to number eight. Change this to the fourth angel arriving. And change this to... Whether this is correct or not, I'm just going to put it here. We'll discuss that. All right. So now we can see we have that whole of that Levitical chiasm, though we know that there is actually an extension there too, because there's the 63 weeks that goes to March 27th, um, 2021. So it's going to be two years after this date. But anyway, so, so we can start to see how these wheels within wheels work, how all of these dates that we have been given are all part of these interlocking structures. But, they're, but when we put them on a line, which is, I think, the failure that, that is being made presently with the Trump prediction and so on, is that we don't have a line. That is, we, in order to interpret these dates, we need a period of darkness, a well-defined first and second angel's message, and a third angel's message, at least, right? Yeah, I'm thinking. And then we need scriptures that we can use. We need a story from the scriptures that we can place on that line. Yes, sir. Right. So we need all of those things in order to understand the significance of the dates and those events connected with those dates. And, and 
an event can have different meanings in different lines. Right? Yeah, we've seen that. We've right. seen that over and over again. Well, 9-11. It's the empowerment of the first angel and it's the arrival of the second. Right. It's 11-9. Right. Yeah, and it's also 11-9. It's November 9th. Right. But it is also just 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel in the line that Jeff created. And there's nothing wrong with that line. Right. When he puts it as the arrival of the second angel and says it's also the empowerment of the first and that, you know, midnight, midnight cry and then Sunday law are still future. There's nothing wrong with that line. Except that. There's more to that line, right, because we we need to recognize that it being the arrival of the second angel is actually a zoom into eleven nine. Right. It is connected to 11 9. 9 11 and 11 9 are not separate symbols. And so, so this is this is the problem that we're having, I believe, is that we need to follow all of these conditions in order to understand what a line means and what an event means. So we have that here in the story of Deborah and Barak, very well defined, um, a very well defined line, with with um, events that come from the symbols. We have a period of darkness. We know what it is. We know that these are a, a, is a message. This is the message of Parminder, and that is going to be addressed by chronology, because in this organization darkness that we have here, um, there's a lot to that, right? That is, there's all that um, in this line of the judges, that increase of knowledge, so to speak, uh, that's there above. There is a counter to it. That is, um, there is this time setting. There is the, the false organization. All of these things, right? So when we look at Deborah and Barack, and remember, Deborah and Barack is a zoom into October 13th, 2018, right? So when we draw out this line um, to September 7th, 2019, uh, so when we draw out this line, this is this message prior to 11.9 that witnesses against Sisera, right? And is going to lead to the end, to that close of probation, which occurs with the line of Gideon. So Gideon is, in a sense, addressing Deborah and Brack because Gideon is the empowerment of the message of Deborah and Brack. Right. Now, it's taken us time, right, to to be able to put together these lines in this fashion. But you can see how powerful this is in the context of line upon line. Right? We, we can see that, that this, how we've laid out this line of the judges, where we started with this, this idea that the judges was from 9-11 to 2023. It has borne out as we've gone through these judges. And every time we go through them, it, it's not a matter of, you know, confirmation bias. It's a matter of we see more and more detail and are able to define these things more and more clearly. And, and this is what the movement needs. Yes, this is what the movement needs. Now, I do believe that part of our message to Seventh-day Adventists is going to come from our understanding of the repeat of Millerite history. So even though we don't have, they don't have to understand all the detail that we present, we need to understand it because we need to have the faith and confidence that God is leading us against uh, terrible pressure and persecution and criticism but also, we need to be able to 
to show where we are in history. The, the basic line that Jeff has given, I do believe, is our message to the Levites, as is Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and, as well as the other prophecies in Daniel. These all will come to bear in our message. But we're not going to be going through all these details of our internal history as, as that message to the Levites. There might be some interested in it and studying it. But that's not our message. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. So yes, yeah, it does seem reasonable. Okay. So so let's look at the scriptures here that we started looking at. Um, on Thursday. So, so what we have is we have um, Jabin, king of Canaan, and we have Sisera, right? And he's going to, um, is Sisera. Is, um, is this period of darkness, right? So this organization of darkness, that's what we addressed. And then we say that there's uh, an invitation that's made in four verse six. And this invitation comes from Deborah who represents uh, FFA in the school of the prophets, right? And Deborah means a bee and we know North Bumblebee Road. And we have Rama and Bethel. So she dwells um, under the palm tree of Deborah, which is between Ramoth and Bethel, right? So that so we have a play, house of idolatry and, and the house of God, right? In Mount Ephraim. And she is a judge. So this represents FFA to this movement. And she gives an invitation right to to Barak. So this is an invitation. Now remember, Barak is a message. He's the son of Obinoam, which means uh, uh, so Barak means what? His name means uh, lightning, but then well, yeah. Samuel also gives him another name. Remember, I uh, sent the email to you or a message. Yeah. So what's what's the name that Samuel calls him? That um... yeah, something like Bedon or something. Yeah. So his name means lightning. Now the significance of one three zero one for his name. The Hebrew number? Did we yeah, have any? Well, that was, yeah, that was from uh, 13,000. Was it was a big number. Was it 1,301,000? I would think so, yes. And 1,301,000. And you had the 1,301 1, years in one of your uh, charts. But, but this yeah. is the number of days from April 12, 1533 BC to April 5th, 2030. Right? So, so it's a message that relates to April 5th, 2030. Right. It's thirty five hundred and sixty two years. If it's divided by two, that is, if you put it into half, um, it ends up being one hundred and seventy eight or one thousand seven hundred and eighty one years. 
which is 178 and 187, looking at it from either direction, which is together 365. Um, and um, 1 million 301,000 days is the 212th node. So the 1301 is the 212th prime, I believe. And also on the Mayan long count calendar, um, the year, the date 130100 is the second month, the 12th day. So it gives you that 212 again, which of re course relates to the Mayan calendar. And, and that second month, 12th day is the 1435 of the year of the Hijra. Yeah, so, so Stephen has this note in the chat. Uh, so some commentators link Samson. So this was being uh, Ben Dan, a son of Dan, as Samson was a Danite. I'm thinking the meaning of the name. So Bidan is another name for Brack. And I think that that's correct. Um, so so Bidan, though, doesn't mean a son of Dan. I think that's the correct uh, incorrect etymology. Uh, ben Dan, because it's not Ben Dan, it's B Dan. Um, but anyway, um, yes, I have uh, another another name for it is uh, so this year. I have this year itself the Fictionary of Bible Names, and uh, it gives it as gives it as what? Uh, it means they, they say it, it means either thought thought rebuff in judgment or some judgment. Okay, it's kind of garbled, having a hard time. Can you just put it into the chat? Because I, I, you know, it's an unfamiliar name. So if you could type it in there. Okay. <clears throat> so all, all we're saying here, though, is Barak. The meaning of his name in Hebrew is the number one three zero one, which would relate to the number of days from the first day, of the the first time that they're given the biblical calendar that the first time they name Aviv or what's later called Nisan as the first month, that's going to be 1533. And that month is going to start on the first day of the first month, of course, April 12th. And if we count the number of days, it's 1,301,000 days to April 5th, 2030. Now, the fact that you can count a number of days from one event to another and have three zeros at the end is fairly significant because that's a one in a thousand chance that you can you can actually have a span of time that's going to have three zeros, right? So it's it's something that's quite 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 rare, and so uh, the fact that it shows these other symbols as well um, tells us something about these first days of the first month, right? <clears throat> Um, and yeah, there's probably more to it that we haven't seen yet. Okay, bedan means fat or robust in judgment. So son of judgment. Okay. So so we have this message. This message. A Barak, and it's connected to this chronology. And and Abinodam, uh, Abinoam, pardon me, Abinoam uh, means sent, or no, pardon me, Father of Pleasantness. I'm thinking of another name, uh, Father of Pleasantness. So so Barak, this message of Barak, is is the son of the father of pleasantness out of Kadesh Naphtali. So we looked at the symbol of Naphtali. And so there's going to be this invitation. So she sent and called Barak Shalak to send away or send or send out or whatever. So she sent out to call Barak, the son of Abinuan, 
out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw the sword, um, or go and draw toward, pardon me, Mount Tabor, and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. Zebulun. So we see Naphtali and Zebulun tied together here. And that ties us to uh, a dilio study that deals with 1629, right? So that becomes part of these symbols. I will draw unto thee to the river Kaishan, Sisera, captain of Javan's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. So there is this. Um, uh, we could say, I, I put here ponderings, but I mean, basically, it's a type of negotiation. Right. So, so this invitation is accepted upon these conditions. Now, I put here that the invitation is marked by September 23rd, 2017. So let's just go back here, just review this. And that's going to be this Feast of Trumpets. Now, this invitation is tied to an invitation. One is, for me personally, to go and teach at the School of the Prophets. So there's kind of an invitation there. Um, but we're saying that because it's the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets is an invitation to judgment. Right. Which is what this line is going to be addressing. Uh, basically, it's pointing to the close of probation 777 days later on November 9th, 2019. So that's going to be the third angel arriving for this line of Deborah and Brack. That's going to be the close of probation for Parminder's movement. So we can see quite clearly here that um, Parminder's movement in setting the state November 9th, 2019, has set up this close of probation for themselves because it's only the false priests whose probation closes. And of course, that's just as a symbol, just because somebody was in Parminder's movement and even is still in it today, doesn't mean their probation is closed, right? As an individual, we're just talking about something on a line. It's symbolic, right? But in a sense, it, it, it's sort of by setting that date, they set this up. But God oversaw all of these things because he had me present 777 days earlier, the symbol of the prediction before midnight. And, and they were believing that they were making this prediction before midnight. And so we can see in this line, October 13th, you know, marks the beginning of the second message. Second message arrives October 13th, where I measure 391 and a half days to November 9th. <clears throat> but this is also going to connect to July 18th. Now, I could probably put here the fourth angel arrives July 18th instead of January 11th, but I'm just going to keep the January 11th there for now because we'll discuss that. So we have this invitation in verse 4 and you know, ponderings, we could have put negotiation. Um, but what we're going to have is the center of this is this empowerment. Now, when we say that, this is actually this whole structure and this line. Now, tied to August 11th, 2018, is this other date. So this is actually when the prediction is made by Daniel. So he's going to make a predi pred prediction and record it on his phone. And he's going to make this prediction on uh, July 27th. So I'm just going to put it here just like that. So when we look at this in the context of all these lines, and we're not going to put all these dates here, but this is a, an aligning with the first Passover prior to um, the first day of the first month. That is, August 11th is going to line up with April 19th, 1844. And this prediction of on July 27th is going to line up with 
April 3rd, right? So this is that period of time in Samuel Snow's letters from the republication of his first letter to the, um, uh, the, the first disappointment. And then his second letter is going to be published on later. So we can actually put in this line um, August 11th as well, but Julian, because August 11th, Julian is going to follow 13 days later. This again is going to line up with the second Passover. So I'm just going to put it here. Eight. Oops. So obviously nothing happens on that date, but that date is part of this structure, right? So, so these are going to line up in Samuel Snow's letters. Okay. So in Samuel Snow's letters, June 9th would line up with February 16th. Right. And, and there's also a six days in there, but we'll leave that out. And then we have July 27th. That's going to line up with April 3rd. August 11th right, lines up with um, April 19th. And August 11th, Julian is going to line up with May 2nd, 1844. And October 13th lines up with June 22nd. So maybe I should draw this line here. Just for Ron. And then we're just going to take uh, these ticks here. Okay, is this making sense? Any comments on this? But now I understand your comment, <laughs> just for Ron. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because you like to have these things here on these charts, right? Well, I like this. Yeah, it helps me visually uh, to remember. Yeah. I still have a hard time when people talk about visually, but... Because people realize there's no such thing as a visual learner, right? That that's yeah, it's, completely psychologically uh, just a fallacy. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It's just how I process, um, how I, my, um, my different circuits bounce around. <laughs> well, all of us, all of us are visual. That is... Everybody visualizes things in or order to remember, them. right? So I think so. I mean, we all do. Most of the people that I've met are like that. Well, everybody is. You couldn't uh, function otherwise. Oops. What am I doing here? Well, I have met some non-functional people before. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Obviously, if a person has severe mental uh, disability. Sorry about this. Um, just trying to get this to look right. Uh -oh. 
Oh, this was selected. Oops. That's where I ran into problems. Okay. So, so we have all these different dates, which I'll put in here as we go through this. So, <clears throat> so we have this invitation accepted. Now, so this invitation is related to uh, this, this line of Samuel Snow's letters, right? So can we see that Samuel Snow's letters uh, represent, represent this history in our movement from June 9th to October 13th? And anybody have problems with this or any observations about it? So when we take these, I think that's what we've worked out over the, over the last few months, years, is okay. the sequence. Yeah. So if we understand this about Samuel Snow's letters, that is, if we look at um, the significance of these letters, um, how do we understand that significance? Like we know that they represent this movement. But here in this line, we're putting it as um, just a very specific span of time. That is, it parallels this history, but it overall addresses July 18th as well, right? So we can take July 18th, which is going to be, um, you know, the red, because this is only part of Samuel Snow's letters, right? So you're going to have June 22nd here. Not here, but here. Have May 2nd as this one. So here we have these, these dates. So these are Samuel Snow's first letter when it's written, when it's republished in the, the Signs of the Times. We have the, the disappointment, which is the center of this. And then we're going to have um, May 2nd. And then we're going to have June 22nd. Now we can see this part ending with June 22nd. June 22nd is a symbol. One is it's Pentecost in 1844. But it's a symbol of FFA. Right? That Jeff has attached to FFA. Okay, and that and that it's significant that this lines up with October thirteenth because a second message arrives. But here, Samuel Snow's letters are going to line up with the formalization of the first angel to the arrival of the second in this line of Deborah and Barak. And so a message arrives, which is uh, the second angel's message on October thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. Initially, it's accepted by Parminder, but Tess rejects it. And so we end up with um, we end up with this date that's going to be connected with Jeff awakening on September 7th, 2019. So one thing that we can see here is that there is other lines within this line, right? That we have wheels within wheels. We can see that this, this is lined up with this line of the Levites. But one of the things that we have with a lot of these other lines, that the way that we have drawn them out in the past, is we didn't draw them out in this fashion, right? That is, we would, we would say something is the midnight cry. We would say October 13th is the midnight cry uh, for the priests, right? And, that, and that's going to make... Uh, November 9th, 2019, the midnight cry for uh, the Levites, right? But then later we said, well, no, that's going to line up with 
um, the first day of the first month, right? The second angel arriving. So, so we were throwing around all of these different terms. We were trying to say, well, where is, you know, this is the battle of Raphia. So it's going to be uh, the second angel. Um, uh, it's going to be the midnight cry. So the second angel uh, formalized. And then July 18th would be the midnight cry, right? So this would be midnight. And then, but, but so we kept attaching these. Um, to, to answer your question, yeah. no, we did not write them down in this fashion. Right. So, but we did, and we did tag the events with these various um, waymarks, but without actually drawing out a line. Right. Which, which, is, which is a mistake, right? I mean, if you're going to say that something is a waymark, you have to have a well-defined line. Now, Parminder had some jerry-rigged sort of lines, right? They, you know, his, they weren't consistent. He basically had four. He had um, the priests, the Levites, the Nethanim, and the 144,000. And he was using the agricultural model and a actually doing what he had accused Chowatu of doing when Chowatu was using the Psalm 23 model. Um, so, so this is, you know, from my perspective, at least, uh, just, you know, it, you have to do this, right? If we're going to understand a date that we're marking on a line, and we're going to give some kind of significance to it, it in a well-defined line. Yes, it does. You just can't have a date and and not have something to attach it to. Now, now what we sometimes do is we look at patterns, right? And patterns exist. That's what drew us lines. to this stuff, is the patterns. Right. But the patterns themselves don't give us the significance unless we put them on a line. And we have a story attached to it that comes from the Agreed. Bible, right? Right. So, and that's why we can do this when in the book of Judges, because God has set up these stories. Men's, God's dealings with men are ever the same, right? And we're not saying that this is the only application of these lines in the book of Judges. This is just where God has directed us for the present time in this detailed analysis of our history that we can put these events, we can, we can see how they parallel to Millerite history in their various ways. And, um, you know, so you can see quite clearly here that June 9th is February 16th. And of course, um, we can see that uh, July 18th, which is, is the publication of his final letter, is would also fit on this line, but we put it as July 18th. Now, of course, July 18th, 2020 is not even on the rest of this line, um, but, but it is part of that fourth angel arrives. So when I put 111 there, I have a reason for it because um, of how I understand that fourth angel's message, that line is going to go from 111 to 111. Right. But when you zoom into that line, it's going to have July 18th, 2020 in it. So it's going to go from 111, 2020 to 111, 2023, a period of three years. And then the fourth angel on that line. So we can take this line of Deborah and Barak and we can zoom into each of these way marks and we can we can find more detail. So there is a line in which October 13th, 2018 is the midnight cry. But it's not this line. So when we were in that line, we didn't know what line we were in when we said October 13th is the midnight cry. 
we didn't have enough information to to say what line we were in. So there is so there is a smaller line that exists. Maybe smaller is not the right word, but a different line that exists when we zoom into October thirteenth itself on this line. Or, or can we call it a fractal? Well, that's what these are. When we zoom in, it's a fractal. Yeah, I missed that word. Yeah, but the thing that that yeah, I don't really like the word, but um, uh. Because I like the wheels within wheels. Oh, yeah. That's a good one, too. Yeah. Because um, I wrote a song about wheels within wheels, about that back in 2000, the year 2001. So, <clears throat> but anyway, using scripture. But anyway, so as you, you look at this, then you can see that... Uh, um, this is the line of Deborah and Brack. It's it's a message that's addressing the time setting of Parminder, but but it's it's doing so because it's addressing the organizational problems that result from Parminder. Now, so one of the things you see here is um, we have all of these different waymarks, right? Um, for instance, we have September seventh, two thousand nineteen. Well, in September seventh, two thousand nineteen. We can actually zoom into that way mark, the battle, and we can create another line. And that line is going to contain um, August 29th, 2019, right? It's going to contain uh, October 13th, 2018. It's going to contain um, June uh, 2nd, 2017. Now, we've drawn out that line before, but we never, we never drew it on a line like this with the waymarks. And, and we, we can show where that line is and why it's there. But we're not doing that right now, right? But we probably need to at some point to draw out these lines more specifically. Now, some of these lines, like when we uh, look ahead here, and we look at the line of Gideon. Um, uh, where is it here? Yeah, Jeroboam and Gideon. You know, we're going to see uh, more dates, right? That that are that attach to November 9th and to January eleventh um, and April fifth, twenty thirty. But each one of these is a period of darkness, and we can mark these darknesses from these various stories. So um, I don't think any of this is contrived. Now, the question is, when we're doing this, uh, it's pretty clear that we're following Miller's rules, that we're following line upon line, that we're comparing things with Millerite history. Now, there are aspects of these things that are subjective, right? So they're not completely 100% objective, but they're witnessed to by objective elements, right? Are you speaking of like the, the symbolic um, use of numbers that confirms uh, what we're thinking? In right. That? Yeah. Yeah. Just like when we look at, Barack's name and we see 1301. Right. Right. And, and we know that that's then witnessing to um, this period of time from the first day of the first month and in, you know, 1533 and the first day of the first month in 2030. I mean, it's just, it's just too obvious to say, well, that's just subjective. No, right. that's a blessed reassurance. Yeah. Right. And and it shows that, that, you know, every step of the way of we've, we've gone through this, we keep seeing these symbols in the right places on the right dates, the spans of time working out, even when we we had no idea those spans of time were there. Right. We just we just we just mark the event that was symbolized, put it on the line and then found 
that there's a witness to it. Doesn't mean that everything about our lines is correct, that there may be things that we don't see or we place incorrectly. But I think that we can quite clearly see that, that this message here was given as a witness against Parminder's organization. And what was given was the very thing that Parminder was trying to use to get his organization. That was the November 9th, 2019 date. And so God gave us this time, this structure that had already been witnessed to in the past, Samuel Snow's letters, Revelation 9, Ezekiel. And he said, here, we can witness to November 9th, 2019, but it's not going to mean what Parminder and Tess say it's going to mean. We also had the week of Christ study that, that was witnessing against what Parminder and Tess were saying about the events of November 9th. But one thing we can say, was it convincing? Were, were Parminder and Tess using the Bible and using spans of time and using chronology to arrive at November 9th, 2019. Um, from what I rem from what I've been hearing about this particular time, it seems as though that that's what they were doing. I mean, they were using those those ways of getting to those things, but it was their conclusions that were right um, and, th and this is what skew. i right but but they witnessed to a correct date too didn't they yeah that was the whole okay. that was the whole thing that we picked up on was that it was recognizing the date now when i when i say that colin is doing the same thing i'm not making a criticism of colin as a person or what he's teaching doctrinally i don't think he's he's not infected with Parminder's theology, right? But he's, but he's using the same methods to arrive at understanding what these dates in the future mean, right? He's basing it upon a biblical prophet, prophecy, the king of the north and the king of the south. Now he's saying this is the correct one, Parminder and Tess did the wrong one. But what we're not doing is we're not drawing them out on a line like this. And if we're not drawing them out on a line like this, we have no way of knowing the significance of these dates that we have. And so we know that that has been carried over, not as a criticism of individuals, but a criticism of what is being taught as far as the conclusions are concerned. But the the dates are correct. That is, those dates have significance, but only if placed on a line. Okay. So anyway, we're going to have to go. I went a little bit over time. We'll come back to this tomorrow. Thank you, Theodore. Okay, you're welcome. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. We pray for one another. We pray for those searching for truth. Um, we pray for ourselves, Lord. You know how deceptive the human heart can be. And we know, Lord, that um, we have been deceived before and we have deceived ourselves. And we pray, Lord, that you can open our eyes uh, to see our need of you. Um, I just ask, Lord, that you can help us in our personal study to search these things out to know what is truth for ourselves. Uh, be with each person today. May your angels watch over them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.